Hello everyone, this is episode 4 of what's now called our Fintorn Barrel. Yeah, we changed the name because this is this is our barrel was getting a bit confusing. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is. Um, so this is Callum Bell here. And Alex Wright. And today we're joined by Jonathan Caddy. Um, Jonathan's been connected to Finhorn for many years. His parents were the part, some of the founders of the spiritual education charity, the Finhorn Foundation. And we're also joined by George the cat, who you might hear purring in the background. <laughs> and George is a very ginger cat. I'm quite ginger myself. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan. Yeah, it's good to be here with you. All right. And uh, yes, George is settled and uh, we're settled for a session here. Yep. Let's see where we go with it. So, Jonathan, what's your connection with Fintern? Well, yeah. A long one, <laughs> mm. a long one. Yes, I mean, my parents were two of the founders of this community. In actual fact, there were four adults that founded this community back in 1962. And, you know, the, the birth date of this community is the 17th of November, 1962. And that at that time, I was six years old and I was in a caravan, the caravan I was born in. And wasn't here at the time, and I was ill, and moving from one caravan park down in the Finhorn village, which was a seasonal one, to here, I was sick, so I was in the caravan when it was moved in in November sixty two, uh, and so that's when this whole experiment started. Actually, that's not true. It actually started uh, about ten years before with my parents' uh, spiritual teacher, which was my father's second wife, Sheena McGovern, uh, who was the teacher for my mum, my dad, for Dorothy McLean, and also Lena Lamont. Lena Lamont uh, n normally is not in as one of the founders, but it's partly her choice. She came from the Isle of Tyree, and Sky and a very conservative and didn't want to the name to get out and and so on the publicity there but she was definitely one of the founders of this community so we were here we're joined by Lena by Christmas 1962 and so there were two caravans here at the end of 1962 with four adults and in actual fact, six children. So we were uh, a small community right from then. Quite lively, it would have been. It was quite lively. And you're asking my, my connection. My connection or my role, if you like, has been as a witness, a witness of now over 60 years of the development of this place. And it's been quite an incredible journey because this was, well, where we are right now at the park, it was created, if you like, uh, during the Second World War. This was a, um, this was part of the RAF, RAF Kinloss, that was set up during the Second World War. And this area had Nissen huts when we first arrived, uh, mostly Polish um, airmen mm. that were stationed here. And we had the mess hall, we had the fire um, the, the, the sort of fire station where the fire engines would have been. Uh, this was a rather windswept um, area, Pine Ridge here, and the trees were about oh, half a meter high. And uh, it's been wonderful to watch the the environment change, but also just to see the magic of tens of thousands of people that have come through this place, given uh, a lot of themselves, have put a lot of uh, love into the very fabric of this place over 60 years. And huge transformation of the physical place, but also of the growth of this community as a positive... Um, as a positive example of living something a bit different. It's not about, I mean, my mother received uh, her inner guidance and uh, in the early days, the community was led by 
by that. But this is this place isn't just about a philosophy. It's about how we actually live our lives. And um, so I've been a witness of how this place can be a catalyst for positive change in our world. And when you were growing up in the 60s and then mm -hmm. on into that, um, when you were seeing your peers grow up alongside you, did a lot of them have similar lives to you at the time or did you feel some sort of difference going on? I think it's important to understand that where you grow up, you think that whatever you whatever you're doing, that's how people grow up, mm. and so you don't see any difference until you actually you leave, and you have more connection with with what what's going on. So for me, that was really going to university. I went to Edinburgh University. I studied ecological science there. And that was partly because I fell in love with the land here. There wasn't a lot of internal space in a, a caravan that was 30 foot long and, you know, eight foot wide or whatever. Uh, so we spent a lot of time as kids outdoors and just exploring what was around. We had no money. We were feral. We just... Uh, we made our own entertainment. We uh, made a lot of um, a lot of different things, huts and rafts, and we collected material and we 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 uh, we did things together. So there was a lot of learning about how to get on with each other, but also about materials, how to put things together, and uh, uh, how to think things through. It was good. Good to have no money. Yeah. Uh, because you could, you really invented a lot more kids here there at that time, yeah. So growing up, we were asking about what was the question? Just um, again, just if you felt any difference compared oh, the to the difference? Yes, yeah, the difference. It, 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 yes, I mean if you look back on it and you see what was happening here. Um, no, my mother received her guidance and visions every day, and that was very much part of her life and, and I guess our life too, because there was a, another caravan that came to join us, uh, which was the place where they held their meditations and uh, they had their connection. The in this inner connection, it wasn't internet. It was the internet. Mm. It, um, it was connecting with people on the inner uh, and and centers of light of 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 special places in the around the earth. Uh, this whole process of spiritual awakening was happening in the sixties. Um, I guess it was. For some, it was a, a wake up after the Second World War, no, no older generation looking at, at something different. But also for younger people, it was the whole flower power, sex, drugs and rock and roll that mm. was going on. And there were a lot of communities forming at that time, lot, just a lot in the ethers of the world. It's a different world right now. A lot in the ethers in the world. And I think that... It's interesting that, you know, different communities like, uh, you know, uh, Oroville and, and Esalen, they, 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 that's Esalen in, in California, mm. Oroville in, in, in India, started at that time, 1962, uh, mm. as an impulse that were, were, was happening in our world. Yeah. And as a, as a child, did it come as a shock, suddenly all these people showing up, or, or were you just kind of going with the flow, you know? As I said, you know, it, uh, you don't see, you, it's only in looking back you see that mm. Mm. this is different and exceptional and so on. Now the note here was sounded very clearly. It was a simple experiment in many ways. It was how can these four people live by this inner knowing, this uh, uh, this connection with spirit. Like how how can that 
happen? How can you dedicate your life to doing doing that? Sounds very simple, but in actual fact, the the um, the working out can be more challenging. Mm. Um, so, it, but that's the essence of it. You know, I say that this place started before us all coming to the caravan park here. You no, know, the there are were certain notes that were sounded, and what I liken is the the image of a drop going into still water. Uh, these notes are sounded. It's like the drop hitting the water, and the form changes. the The essence is the same, but the form changes over time, and that you know those notes are to do with our. A connection with whatever we call it, spirit, uh, God, our, our inner connection with uh, ourselves, uh, really important, not just looking at uh, going out there, work and getting things and money and all that sort of mm-hmm. thing, um, but that inner connection first, and then all those things come afterwards, so putting priorities in a different way. Second is that connection, that deeper connection with, with uh, the essence of nature. Nature being not just about resources to build our homes and uh, uh, our technology and, and and our lives, but actually how do we live with the um, the deeper connection with nature? We're we're part of nature. How do we do that and how do we connect with that? I think that's a big note that has been sounded here that is really important in the world at this time. Mm. You no, know, it is something, yeah, with not just climate change, it is like uh, our relationship with the, our environment, our disconnect. It is just so important that we... We, we see ourselves as part of and how do we live a a life that a, that um, brings more biodiversity brings more um, the, more of the wonders of 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 the natural world into our our lives so that's the second note third being that of of, of community we lived as i said from the start in 1962, we, we were a small community uh, uh, here. Uh, it is a bigger than the nuclear family. How do we learn to get on with each other? This is mm. important because if we can't do it in our daily lives with people that are around us. How can we do it as, as countries, as nations mm. and so on? Um, how do we find ways of of uh, living in in alignment with each other? Yes, having disagreements and so on. But I think over sixty years, the place has has learnt a bit more about you know what what makes uh, living together work a bit better. What I would say is, and what I I, I think is terrific is that people that have come here aspire for creating something different doesn't mean that we always get there doesn't mean that things are perfect not at all but at least people are willing to put in the effort to aspire to create positive change in our world I'm going to add a fourth note, and that is that this place, it isn't a utopia, it isn't about creating uh, something special here in the northeast of Scotland, uh, but it is about a living, living demonstration that has an impact in the world, and it's about that world work, that it's about, it's not just about doing something here, it is about having relevance in our, our world today to create impact, a positive impact in our world today. And that is incredibly important. And uh, 
Hmm. We always at a time of change in the world, but I think we're at a extremely important time right now, and I do think that the place uh, has had relevance as a catalyst for change, and it does going into the future. Uh, it needs to change, and COVID uh, fires that took out our sanctuary and our community centre, the heart and soul of our um, our, our community, uh, the foundation, which uh, you mentioned at the beginning that my parents founded the foundation. They, they didn't. They founded this place, and there was mm. 10 years before the foundation came into existence. It wasn't until 1972 that the foundation came into existence. And what was the, the, the reason for creating the foundation? Was it to, to look after the buildings, or what was the... The reason... Well, in actual fact, um, before the foundation, there was another charity that was set up, the Finton Trust, and uh, it, it, it lasted for a few years. There needed to be a legal body to take in, take in um, money, uh, and to actually uh, work with the whole community that was was develop, you know, developing here, and the Finhorn Trust. Yes, it was set up, but it needed a, it needed a more detailed constitution, um, and that's why it was a legal entity. It was changed in seventy two. I guess it was to taking on properties. I mean, one was the park building next to the Universal Hall, and that was a gift, and, and there has to be an entity that takes, that to hold a legal entity. So the foundation became the legal entity that could allowed the community to operate as a as as a separate separate entity than the individuals that were were being attracted to this place, um, and as I say, now we're kind of transitioning to a new phase, really, with the, how the community is structured and and. and Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So if we jump right forward to <laughs> to right now, if we leave all the other stuff, um, we maybe go back there yeah. and we jump to to right now. Yes, we we are always in a state of change. That's life, and certainly life in this community. There have been a lot of different uh, uh, changes that have happened, oftentimes from financial crises because I mean one thing was the in 90 in the middle of the 1980s there was a financial crisis within the foundation and not everyone that was actually a member because we we're called members then rather than co-worker could could um, be held within the umbrella of the Finhorn Foundation and so some people chose to leave and some people chose to stay and those that stayed had to find their own work meaningful work and places to stay and that is where we get the development of a community around a spiritual and educational charity which is the the principal raison d'etre of uh, of of the Finhorn foundation but in actual fact the foundation became the community. It was the community. Everyone that was involved in the work here uh, before the 1980s, uh, from the from 1972, was was part of the foundation. But then it changed uh, at that time, and that was a big big change. So, so uh, then, if we go forward from mid uh, mid 80s, you 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 have the development of a community around the spiritual and educational uh, charity. And many of the departments of the, uh, the, the um, Finhorn Foundation became businesses. For example, Finhorn Press or um, the shop or, um, you know, different, different parts have become uh, uh, other organizations. And there are other 
organizations in the area like Biometrix uh, Water or AES uh, Solar. You know, these are these are businesses that have, have, have developed out of the principles or people attracted to this place, attracted to the principles of, of the place. And so you've got this this uh, larger community developing around the spiritual and education, ec- educational charity. Okay, we're jumping forward mm. to now. To now, yes, we've, as I mentioned, uh, we have had COVID, we've had the fires, we've had the Fintorn Foundation not having guests because uh, much of the financial viability was reliant upon guests coming to here for transformational education, the educational programs on, on here for two years. And the reduction in the size of, of the co-worker body from 120 down to about 60, so half half the size there. And just, a, a, you know, the again, financial pressures. It's interesting because finance often reflects, you know, are you doing the, the bigger work that, ha- that people want in the world? That mm. are, you know, if you're doing the right, if, if you're doing... If you're putting your energy into doing the right thing, looking at that bigger uh, vision, so much of the time the the the, the people, the money, uh, and so on, follows through. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, because you've got actually the eye on the goal rather than just working out. Oh, how do we make ends meet? Mm. And so, just to have that eye on the bigger picture. So yes. What is happening right now is that the, the the foundation is having to release some of its assets because it was the community, but it's held on to 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 managing an estate here, which isn't actually part of uh, the uh, purposes of a spiritual and educational charity, and it needing to release some of that into. What we call what we're calling the common ground to, you know, can the community is the community big enough to 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 take some of those responsibilities on? How can we how can we make this change as as smoothly as possible? How can the community that surrounds the the, the foundation grow to create the right governance structures to make this possible? You know, mm-hmm. I think that that uh, you know that is the that is the question, and you know, it is like, it's like we talk about community, but how you know that identity? Uh, what is that identity? Because the community involves the foundation as well. It's like the foundation might see itself as the most important thing, as if it is the heart of this place. Uh, but the heart doesn't function without everything else, and there needs to be good connection between the heart and the head, and mm-hmm. and, and the bones and the skin and the, and everything else, uh, you know. So it is like a major transformation that we are in the middle of, as the world is in the middle of a transformation. That's that's you know, uh, the big thing is is. <laughs> It seems like it was COVID, but actually that was um, there's an interesting little cartoon, and that is there's these two scientists and they're they're there looking at the 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 wave of COVID and the numbers of cases and and deaths and 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 so on, and they're they're busy poring over this data. Meanwhile, there's a tsunami, a gigantic wave of climate change, mm. uh, just about to engulf them. Uh, all there, so the, you know the bigger issues there are, are are there. Yes, COVID has been a way that the world can come together in some ways. There's some there's but there's a united um, a challenge uh, that people have had to adapt to uh, in, in our world. But you know there are big big things going on. So just going getting back to what's happening now in our community. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's important that we sort out uh, what's happening internally, but also to be aware that ultimately 
the reason that for this place is to have a positive impact out in the world. How do we, mm. how, how do we actually um, demonstrate something different? I think that's part of the power of the place. Mm. Uh, not about just a philosophy and talking about things, mm. but actually how do we live our lives a bit differently so, or, or to give alternatives. Related to that very concrete action that we're talking about, there is another organisation in Fintorn that I'd like to talk about. So you're involved with the Fintorn Hinterland Trust and the Fintorn Hinterland Trust is connected to the living land of the place. So I'd like to hear about uh, your personal connection to the Fintorn Hinterland Trust and how that's reflective of your connection to the living land around here. Okay, yeah. Well, as I said right at the beginning, you know, <laughs> we came here and lived in this caravan, but it was a very small space, so our time was spent out and around in the local area. And uh, that's when, that's when, I, uh, for me, I developed uh, this uh, keen observation. I was actually quite a, a quiet, I was a very quiet uh, young boy. And that was partly because I had um, squint eyes. My confidence was not um, uh, there as an individual. I spent a lot of my time, maybe until I, my Saturn return, until I was 28, watching, observing things and uh, uh, looking at what's, what's going on around me. And that actually was important in terms of just exploring the local environment here. And we're next to woods. As I said, they were planted just before we came here. They've made such a difference in creating a microclimate, especially here in, in Pine Ridge, to make uh, living here in the northeast of Scotland uh, a, a much more pleasant uh, place to be. Mm. Um, it, it's changed the, yeah, change how we can live here. But uh, yeah, so the connection was from then, uh, the Wilkes Woods and the whole estate here, interesting, there was a big sign at the end of what we call the runway there, at the top there, and it says private property, keep out. Mm. And uh, the rumours of Mr. Wilkie, who owned the, 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 the estate here, going around with his shotgun <laughs> and, and so on. And, uh, but the, of course, this was the place for especially young boys to be. And this is where we spent a lot of our time here and also in the barley fields out uh, to the south of uh, what was the caravan park and then to the west uh, over on the cars and the bay and the water. So it was a fantastic uh, area to grow up as a kid outdoors. And the, the woods and the dunes were places that we'd spend quite a lot of time, as I said, making huts and so on. But the other thing, you know, it, it, it's, you could say it's terrible uh, uh, nowadays, but one of the things that I did with my colleague from Fintorn, a friend from Fintorn, is we collected birds' eggs. <laughs> no, we collected birds' eggs. You have to, to be able to do that, and people did this at the time, to be able to do that, you had to know intimately not just what birds are there, where they're nesting, but also when you can actually take eggs because you need to take eggs at right at the beginning of when they lay, then they will actually keep laying so that they have the same number of eggs there. Also, when you take the egg, they, then you can blow it. If you take it later, when it has a chick forming in it, I shouldn't be telling you all of this. <laughs> we may try you know, it. It, Because it's illegal now. <laughs> well, uh, but at the time it wasn't. Don't try this but at it, home. Uh, yeah, you don't try this at home. But it, no, I think the, that uh, you know, there's a whole art to, to it. You know, I can remember climbing <laughs> up trees and getting eggs there and finding, you know, where curlew egg, you know, eggs were out here or or where the turns were or whatever. I knew intimately where, where these uh, birds were. But that's just an example of what I was doing on the land uh, here uh, as a young person. And 
it, it, you know, spending hours down in the cars and to the pools there, catching sticklebacks, catching eels, you know, digging in the sand for the, we call them two black eyes, the siphon tubes of, of our clams, you know, to be able to dig those up or, or to, uh, you know, catch the, catch the sticklebacks and just catch the, um, the, all the different creatures, which are just spending hours you know, barefoot and shorts and summers seem to be warmer then. Uh, mm. Or maybe it was just tougher. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know. It could have been a bit of both. Um, but yeah, so that is where I sort of fell in love with the land here. And one of the reasons why I went um, and, and studied ecological science, I was interested. I, I, I liked looking carefully at things. Uh, and um, yeah, so uh, again, we need to step forward into me coming back to this community. I was away, I've traveled a lot around the world. Yeah, I've done a lot of different things. Very interesting CV. Um, <laughs> yeah, you were going to interview me for that. Uh, but, you know, coming back here, um, building my house. Uh, here, this house that we're in right now, but that was in 1994, 91, building a house with my brother for my mother uh, down near the central area near where the sanctuary was. Um, yeah, so, yeah, coming back here, and uh, I, I was teaching, uh, I've actually taught for about 30 years, primary and doing various uh, things in education in the local area but I have always been involved uh, with the community when I came back I um, I was involved in setting up what's called June land the um, yeah so the company that actually I was one of, with Craig <laughs> we were two of the initial shareholders for for June land that was back in 1997 I think it was um I was on the board for 17 years so I, I, I I've been involved in that and then as part of that looking after the land I got involved with what was Finhorn hintland group looking at the conservation aspects so I've been involved in in doing other things in the community. If you like being on the on the periphery, but in actual fact, and it's like a tree. A tree actually grows from the outside. The act of growth is on the outside. It's mm. not on the. Yes, the trunk moves a little bit and in, in girth and so on, but actually, the processes and so on are happening in the on the periphery, and that's how I got involved in. Uh, in a group called the Finhorn Hinterland Group, and that was about 15 years ago. Um, and it came about because Duneland, it owned about 400 acres from this community to the sea, from the what was the RAF base to Finhorn Village. It bought this land, a sort of miracle that we managed to get the money for that at that time and we had two seeming disasters one was a huge storm back in 2005 mm. and that knocked down several compartments of uh, of the woodland that were next to here a great destruction uh, followed quite rapidly by a major gorse fire out on the dunes and uh, we looked at the opportunity of extending the woodland uh, towards the village of, of Finthorn because the gorse had been burned. It was an opportunity to extend the woodland. And so there was a proposal that that was developed by Juneland, helped by myself and friend uh, Hugh Andrews, uh, to extend the woodland. And we would have a community meeting down in the village hall in Findhorn Village. I was expecting about a dozen people. Instead, we had over 200 a packed oh, audience, nice. <laughs> partly because people interested in 
change, if there's any change going to take place. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it would have been a big change at the time. It would have been well. a big change. But it was a proposal there. We thought, felt it was a positive change. But what was clear is that the local people wanted to have a say as to what happened on the land. And through collecting names and people interested from the village and, and here at what's now called the Park Eka Village Findhorn, um, we, we got together to start with, you know, 25, 30 people or whatnot to actually develop a way forward. And out of that came this uh, community group, Findhorn hinterland group and we ran that until 2015 um i was just a rep on there um uh, but in 2015 yeah we needed to change it we changed it to a charity to uh, an incorporated organization uh, back in 2015 we needed to change the structure because what i believe and i took on the chair being chair there what, what I believe is that we as individuals are important, but in actual fact, good work needs to carry on past the sell-by date of all individuals, and mm. structures are even more important going into the future. So good ideas can be taken into the future. What we have right now is we, we do manage uh, the land. We don't own land apart from our green burial uh, site that is, is there. Uh, but we manage through management agreements and management plans with the foundation, with the with uh, June Land, uh, with with other landowners there. And uh, we, 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 it what is important is that we look at the long term. We are the burial authority for this green burial uh, site, so we need to. We are responsible legally for a hundred years after the last burial. So we have to think ahead a little bit. <laughs> How, just and a we're bit. <laughs> also involved in looking after ecosystems, you know, that not just the woodland, but also rare uh, ecosystems like the maritime heath that is out on the dunes and, and, and so on. And when we're talking about ecosystems, we're not talking about the next five or ten years. We're talking about lifetimes. And so we, we need to the, the right structures... And I feel privileged in being able to give back to the land that gave me so much. Uh, in, as a, as a kid growing up here, to be able to give back, because some people say, you know, more people, more people have been attracted here, and and more people on the land mean more destruction. I say the opposite. I think it depends on on how people engage with the land around them and in actual fact if we do that properly we can bring we can uh, make sure that we conserve the the biodiversity of that land and actually encourage more and we can have people that are more aware of how we interact with the living environment next to us i want to just say that yeah to for people to wake uh, and, uh, yeah to wake up i think we forget it that there are tens of thousands of other living creatures that actually live right next to us they have our their life cycles so they they depend on 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 specific environments uh, for their life cycles their parallel lives to ours that are happening you know that that that, that are happening now and mm. we get so focused on what we are doing as human beings. Yes, okay, we've got a responsibility there, but it's important to be open to the wonder of what is around us and to actually cherish the beauty that is there in the natural world. And hopefully that inspires uh, to have nature as at the centre of every community, not just this community here, but every community. Yeah, and that is our vision mm-hmm. uh, as, a, as the Fintorn Hinterland Trust. Uh, how do we bring that there? And, and you know, it is about engaging people actively in, in uh, getting out there and doing something with their hands, something getting away from the digital world, getting away from from uh, uh, yeah, just the mind 
but actually doing something and connecting with spaces by actually putting a little bit of their effort into, uh, yeah, practical work. And this kind of ethos that you have in the Fintorn Hinterland Trust, did you find that that was existing already throughout your education career? Like, did you bring that sort of approach to education? And I also wonder, um, was your education career, was it at all informed by your experiences in Fintorn before getting into education, into primary school teaching? Yeah. A couple of important things before getting into education, because I, I actually went fairly late into that career. And I think that's quite important. So you've got life experience that you can bring to the classroom to bring to young people. But there were a couple of things. And one was actually living here and that connection with nature here and uh, and also with the community here too because it made, made me question things. It made me question about reality, especially when I went to university because I had to look at, okay, there's some... At the time, David Spangler brought a different impulse here of, of education to the community, a different uh, aspect to, to this place. That was in the big, uh, early 1970s, 1970 to 1973. And, you know, I had to question the words that were used here, especially when I was at... at you know, living outside here, it, 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 I had to come to terms with that. And what I realized that words are fine, mm. but if it's not reflected in who you are, mm. you know, your connection with self, who you are, how you affect the world around you, you know, how, how you uh, respect or don't, the living world around you that is different from the human world and and yeah how you connect with other people um in the actions you do if it doesn't if people don't see that in you what are all the words words about so mm. it is really it was a very uh, it was a fundamental thing that that happened for me that reflective time because my parents did not push anything of this uh, community on us three boys. I was living here with my two brothers uh, in, in the caravan. There were six of us in that caravan. So that was important. That was important. And also the connection with the land. I, I was interested in everything. And that's why mm. ecology actually worked well for me because it is like looking at the big picture of how uh, how weather and soils and people and uh, and uh, you know the diversity of life uh, um, and nutrition the, 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 the uh, balance of, of uh, minerals and so on uh, all work together in, in, in a system looking at the bigger picture that was important for me too I didn't want to specialize into microbiology or whatever I wanted to keep that bigger vision I think that's important but the other thing is that when I did leave uh, university I came back I, I worked in the garden here for a season I was involved in this in helping to develop Calern and had uh, in the, the gardens were happening there um, but and I realized that this was too close to home and the opportunity came for me to uh, go to Erid to first uh, for the community to explore that. So that's a, a an island of one square mile on the west coast of of uh, Scotland, and uh, the two Dutch brothers that owned it, uh, the Van der Sluis, uh, family. I think there was a friend of their mother that came to Experience Week. That is the the uh, core program people will know, maybe not, um, that core program that run, ran for 44 years, but virtually unchanged uh, within our community, came here. And they were looking at having this place for their family for a month in, in the year and how to maintain it. And approached my father 
and uh, we went across and we thought, yep, yeah, good idea, partly because we were looking at the time of the community moving from not just Killarn, where we grew, um, uh, you know, some salad crops and, and so on, but actually a farm. And this was a progression of, of involving animals on a bigger bigger scale. So this was going to be ideal. So I went there with uh, three other people. It was just four of us to start with and started that uh, the communities that are still going and that experience. And for me, it was like I had my years of practical uh, after my years at, which was more intellectual, in in the uni in the university, so it was practical about yeah you know, how do you um, grow your food and 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 store it and and so on how do you yeah augment that with fishing and and uh, and so on how do you look after animals and integrate that there and one of the things was that. To start with, I was involved with animals. We got involved with goats, which weren't mm. ideal for the island. And then, uh, you know, first milk cow, and that was all a big experience. But it's a lot, again, of bringing theoretical ideas into practice. And I think that's important for me, has been important for me in my life. It's important for this place as well. How do we bring good ideas inspiration into practical form. So these two things have really helped me in good stead. On on Ered, I, I learned, it, it was seminal in that I learned a lot of very basic skills that we as humans uh, um, work with, you know. It was about uh, how to shear sheep, how to spin wool, how to knit, how to weave. Uh, how to grow food, how to preserve that, how to um, uh, how to get on with each other on in in an intense uh, island situation, mm. which involved uh, mandatory uh, meetings that we hated. Well, <laughs> which we found was was important, but we hated in some ways. It ended up with slamming of the doors or sometimes and uh, and so on. But it was important for us to talk with each other, to share with each other to clear the air because if you don't do that things build up and build up so it was it was important uh, very important for me and I used a lot of that when, uh, going into teaching and, and one of the things that I uh, uh, one of the things that was important was always to base teaching on doing something with the kids to, to start with you know if we were talking about early people, um, mm. you know, you make a full-size cave out of rolled newspaper and, 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 <laughs> and, and you know, and, and uh, wallpaper and, and uh, you know, you do blown um, uh, outlines of hands and uh, stick on your, 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 your paintings of, of woolly mammoths and all that. <laughs> so you, you, you build a, a full-size woolly mammoth out of, of 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 uh, you know um, a rolled um, a paper and paint mixing and papier mache and all that sort of thing. They would you remember know, that a lot more than a textbook. Uh, uh, it, it, what it is is it gives uh, you know something to hang. hang. Alex, was you going to? Well, say? Well, I was just thinking a full size mammoth made out of paper might. Take a lot of paper. <laughs> it, took a, it took a lot of paper, but it lasted a, a lot, lot of, of uh, years. It actually it wasn't a 3D one. It was 2D. Okay. It was yeah. 2D, and it, it, it actually got put up in... I was living down in East Lothian at the time. It got put up in the uh, in the P hall up above everything. So it stayed there for many years. So mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't... It was certainly reused from, from year after year. So we, 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 were, we were thinking about that uh, too. So to base learning on, you know, these triggers. If, if, so the, the kids remember, oh, yes, I remember when I did that. And, and, and uh, they know a little bit about it. So they, they have this, this feeling of um, confidence in, in their inquiry, that you're giving confidence to, to the, the pupils. I thought before I went into teaching, I thought that uh, it was about learning about stuff, 
you know, things. But actually, when I got there, it wasn't. It was about kids learning about their relationship with themselves, mm. their relationships with their peers and how to get on with them and their relationship with the teacher and other adults. And with the teacher, you see the teacher in a more intense environment than anyone else in their lives at that time. Mm. And it is, you know, it is really important. You don't, things don't always work with every pupil. But for some, I'm still getting some pupils coming back to me and saying, Mr. Caddy, you, you changed my life, mm. you know, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that that was important. And what I could do is I could bring the travels that I, I'd done, the exploring the world. I, I traveled around the world for a couple of years visiting mo actually mostly national parks and wild places and uh, uh, had a wonderful set of slides and, and, and so on. But I could bring the world into the classroom I, I, I could uh, bring... And to get the kids excited about the uh, world. Yes, as well. uh, absolutely. And and also um, in terms of the things that I did on ERID gave me, uh, you know, that tactile, that practical background and could bring things uh, into the projects that we were doing. So we would, um, you know, we would look at, I don't know, a... Uh, using natural um, lichens and, material, and and plants uh, for, for dyeing wool and, uh, and creating, well, creating things there. Making landscapes out of rocks and, 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 and uh, peat and, and, and moss and, and whatnot and, and, and paint and, and so on. So you have the uh, volcanic island that you can create your village and so on. And, uh, there. I want to and be then, in your classroom. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's interesting you say that because we had, we, I, I um, maybe sometimes I'd have some difficult children in there and the educational psychologists, I remember educational psychologists spending a morning in the, in the classroom and uh, came to me afterwards and said, just seeing that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I want to be in your class. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want lovely. to be the school now. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just lovely. And, and interesting, I mean, I think that teaching for me, I, 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 it, did, it did bring a certain discipline. You have to jump through the hoops, the paperwork, and people say there's a lot of admin and all that sort of thing, a lot of hard work as well. And, you know, you don't know if you, you, you just do your best. You don't know what effect you're going to have in the future. You can't e expect that, but you just do your best. And that's the same in life as well. Just do your best. You don't know what um, a positive impact that will have, but you do your best. And, and uh, yeah, that's how good things do mm. happen. Um, and the, yeah. the way that you're describing your teaching and education, it really makes me think of Robin Williams' character in the Dead Poets Society. And, you know, the emphasis in education usually, from my experience, usually is learning things by rote almost from the book, um, which I think in Scotland's especially traditional. But I wonder then, did you ever find any resistance in the educational establishments you were in to have this more like relational, practical um, approach to learning? Or were you always like free and open and... Um, given good space in your establishments to do that? Yeah, I mean, that's quite interesting. I just go back and say that, you know, I, I, a number of times I got from parents feedback, you, you know, you did a great job with my daughter or with my son there. You didn't just teach them about things, about things. You taught him or her how to learn. Mm. Uh, yeah, how to be inspired about learning yeah and the importance of that yeah so in terms of um did i you know did i have to um if i did i find resistance uh, and you talk about scottish education scottish education luckily it was also moving in the same di direction so that it was was child and still is child-centered learning 
it's not you know you, you as a teacher can set up to teach something and tick the box oh i've taught that that doesn't mm. mean the kids have learned anything yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> doesn't, doesn't mean we, we, you've ticked a box you've gone through cu- the curriculum and you've 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 covered uh, you know decimals um or you've covered um whatever it is uh there uh, but it is uh, and, and uh, you know really taking more of the lead from the kids what are they interested in what you know what where can you engage the the, the kids in what what it is that uh, um the because it's quite a lot of their time that you're, you're spending it's it's a it's, uh, it is uh, really important that you um use that time wisely so i actually found there was uh there was openness and support generally mm. i did find in the profession that uh, the, some teachers loved control and it was death by a thousand worksheets oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> which uh, you, you giggle but it's like because you might have had experience uh, yeah, of that it's not fun going through it <laughs> it's not fun going through it uh, but I I just felt that sometimes that was good because I knew that the basics would be covered in terms of spelling and basic numeracy here. Not that I didn't do you know help progress that, and in the year before me and the year after me, so I could actually do what I was best at uh, with with the kids uh, during the time. So uh, you know, for example, at school here. I did love art, but because I was good at science, it pushed me to go. They're saying, oh, you can come back to art later on. You know, you can come mm. back. You, 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 you do this. Uh, it, it's better. And it's only when I went back to train as a primary school teacher and had two mad uh, uh, teachers m- myself who really just had to just play and, and explore things. Um, uh, that I got back into art and rather than you know just the constraints of keeping everything neat and doing that to actually have people explore express through art and make a mess if uh, need be because mm-hmm. that yeah so quite willing to to make a mess uh, to uh, so that the kids can find out have fun yeah I remember when I was a probation... No, I was actually training as a teacher down in Edinburgh. I can remember it was a Monday morning and... No, Monday. it came to Monday afternoon. We're doing a project on fish, <laughs> right, on fish. And I'd gone to the... I'd gone, gone and uh, bought fish that morning. Uh, you know, nice big octopus and big <laughs> fish, all right? So, they, they, you know, with, with their heads on and not just fish there. So they could actually explore. And this was, I think it was a prime. Oh, it was, I think it was only primary three or something like that. Anyway, they, I, I, I chose, this would be a charcoal. Um, they, they were going to be using charcoal to, to actually draw these fish. I, I was thinking cook the fish, no. What was that? <laughs> I was thinking cooking the fish. It got all this Yeah, charcoal. cooking. No, no, no. This is actually, draw, first of all, drawing, not cooking, all right, <laughs> to, to start with. Uh, but, uh, you know, on a Monday morning, there's some lovely white shirts that come in. And you can imagine with their hands all over these fish and charcoal <laughs> on the paper, you can imagine uh, the, the, the stage. I, I learned uh, something. I learned something about that. I uh, just um, keep it, yeah, to have the painting pennies on and, uh, and, and n- not a Monday morning. I wonder if that right. washed out later. <laughs> yeah, well, it would have washed out, but um, uh, yeah, so there was, there was quite a bit of learning that, that for me, and yeah, I put effort into my into my teaching. I loved teaching and still do. Um, though I moved on, I, I trained in primary. Primary uh, teaching is great in that you're teaching a whole person, not just mm. a subject. Um, but I, I I did various other things. I worked for the visual impairment service because I had uh, problems with my eyes early on and. Uh, 
that was that was good to be able to go between the you know nursery primary and secondary it's a privilege to be able to jump uh, between the levels in in the system to uh, see yeah different kids at different ages uh, be work with autistic uh, children work learning support yeah, so I did quite a diff quite a few different things, and for the last ten or so years, I taught English as an additional language. So that's for uh, pupils that have one or more other languages uh, that they come with, or are more. Well, there were a lot of quite a lot of migrants. There was about a th thousand uh, migrant children in. Uh, Murray at the time but now more refugees particularly Syrian mm. uh, refugees and Ukrainian refugees right now and uh, so I taught uh, about 10 years there and it was important for me because or I thought it, w it fitted me quite well because I was I'd been brought up at this place in this place so I was used to people coming from different uh, parts of the world to having different customs different ideas about things uh, and so I n knew what it was like to feel different mm. um, and also um, yeah to be <laughs> stigmatized in, in 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 some ways to not be seen for who we are mm. but people's projections as to who we are um uh, and how that is not right it is it's devastating you're not uh, you're disempowered you're you're labeled um and it can be very destructive and challenging you know, because I did have that a bit in the schooling here, mm. you know, just being seen as different. Not that I felt different, but uh, to be put in a box uh, and not uh, uh, not be seen, not be seen for yeah the person that I am. Anyway, that you so saw this working with uh, pupils from different. Uh, different countries coming to our schooling system and not working with families as well and helping them uh, with uh, uh, dealing with a new culture, dealing with a uh, new language often. Uh, oftentimes, just uh, we think wherever we live that this is how the world works. Well, it does here, but it's not really how the world works. Mm, the uh, world works in, in many ways, in, I guess. In, in different ways. And I think mm -hmm. um, my travels have really shown that up as well. Just uh, what we think is normal is not normal uh, for mm. most of the world. Uh, we get, again, just going back to how we connect or don't connect with the nature around us, um, uh, because, we, we, we are, because we concentrate on, on what we're doing as a human community. Uh, same with uh, just cultural diversity uh, we get uh, we are aware of what happens locally and uh, the customs and so on we do, we actually are blind because we don't see <laughs> mm, how, very narrow how, vision how, how well how na we think that we've got broad vision mm. and, uh, but in actual fact we we have a, a narrow vision there and how important it is to um, have contact and to learn about different ways of doing things. I'm very much linked to this idea of cultural like, uh, diversity and getting past people stigmatizing other people. You've told me recently that you're getting involved with a new organization that's going to support refugee people in Murray. And um, can you talk a bit about that organisation and what your involvement is? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it sort of grown out of my work with the pupils, English as additional language pupils and their families. 
and the principal teacher that I was working with, and he was a, he's been a colleague for the last, uh, I would imagine, about 10 years. Um, he was principal teacher down in, in, in Fife. Uh, he's Egyptian, Nabil Ramsey, and he works for Murray Council there. And this has been one of his dreams because he has... He has put through, I don't know, eight, ten um, people that have come as economic migrants or, or, or refugees uh, here. Oftentimes what happens is because they don't know the language, because they don't know the system, they are on the work place, work lines of um, local local businesses here. Yes, it provides the basics and the and the and, and jobs and, and so on. But you know, some of them are coming with two PhDs with with wonderful um, uh, credentials and um, they come with a lot to give. And uh, because they don't know the language, because they can't navigate through the hoops and mm. we, we as monolinguals have difficulty yeah. caught in a in, 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 in a queue for I don't know banking or for whatever to to, to try work out uh, uh, some financing or, or 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 whatever it is it is difficult or even filling in forms it is uh, difficult in our world but if you don't know the language if you don't know what's expected cultural differences it is uh, difficult to navigate so what he's mm -hmm. done is that uh, got them into volunteering positions and then working in schools and classrooms and then uh, they may have been teachers before or, or, or maybe not uh, and uh, going into the teaching profession um, uh, so actually using their qualifications and that's what this the ideals of the new organization looks like we're going to be taking over one that was already uh, set up as a charity but is no longer functioning. Murray Supports Refugees. Yeah, Murray Supports Refugees, which did a great job in, in uh, alleviating poverty, oftentimes in countries around the world, collecting clothes and so on, set, uh, sending that out. Our purposes will be a bit different in that we will actually be supporting not just refugees but migrants as well uh, within Murray and really seeing how they can fulfill their potential as individuals which will help their families, which will actually help the community so that they can give to communities and will ultimately help this country because we need you know, we we need skill. They, they, they've developed skills elsewhere. Someone else has paid for their their upbringing and their education and so on. It is only right that we bring that uh, to the uh, uh, to their work here in in this country here, so that they can uh, fulfil their potential and you know be a much more positive um, and equitable society that's what we're looking for um in this bit of education too about cultural diversity about yeah what i was talking about difference will we still operate under the name murray supports refugees no we will we'll, we'll change it we'll change it once it, we're actually take over the the charity uh there which is murray supports refugees well we'll just change it uh, slightly murray supports migrants and refugees but we will change um we will change the what do you call it um purposes of the charity so we will make those changes we'll take over their bank account there's a few hundred pounds there that at least we'll have that to to get get started but the idea would be to not just have people from education involved but also other uh, services so that there is a link that can uh, and a knowledge that can support these people oftentimes it requires getting to know the individual case to make sure that they can 
uh, you can give the right leads as to which way forward to go. So we'll see how we see how we get on. But it's nice to be able to again give back to something that I have appreciated in terms of my work life uh, and in terms of the people that I have met through um, teaching in this way. Mm. Through the education, through Hinterland, through this new endeavour to support refugee people, there really seems to be a common threads or common threads between them all. In my view, there really seems to be a real passion to help others, not just humans as well, and to improve the world in some sort of way. It seems like you're, I don't know, you're just really driven, but in many directions. Where where would you see, if, I mean, you might, is, is that the impulse behind it? Is there some other impulse behind it? And where does this come from, would you say? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, one of the things is that I feel like I have been given, I've been privileged, you know, a lot of us are privileged. I've been given a lot in my life in terms of uh, growing up here within this community my role as a witness of, of watching 60 years of, of development and, and miracles happen uh, within, this, uh, within this community here and how so many uh, people with positive vision have come through and given to this place. You know, it's hard not to have that rub off into, into your very being. And the fact that we observed what was happening, we were not forced to believe in, in, in anything. So that passion, if you like, passion has come similar to what I talked about in the classroom. Uh, it, 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 it's about it, it's about not not just the rote learning. It is about actually the motivation behind how we live our lives and what we mm. do and how we learn and so on. So I think that it's come subtly through being involved in this community. And I have been involved in this community, unlike my two brothers. I've lived quite a lot of my life within here. So it comes, the passion comes from, yes, yeah, seeing, as I said, seeing this place as a, a, an important catalyst in the world and wanting to make sure that it works with and adapts to the needs of the world right now so that it can have the most significant impact in, in in the world for positive good mm. so yeah so that that's where the motivation that's where the motivation comes i think it is it's about giving back it's about yes uh, we we receive a lot but how can we find our niche because it you know what you do Callum, what you do, Alex, you were finding your niche as to how can we actually most effectively use our talents um, uh, to gain benefit the higher good. Mm. Not always. Oh, I need a job. I, need to get, <laughs> I know. It, I know that a lot of people. That is it. it it's it. I just need a job, and 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 people do great things as well within their their work, and often find themselves within their work, and and so on. But uh, also to make that conscious choice to aspire for something uh, something bigger than ourselves. No, and I think that's what that's what inspires me, mm. um, and trying to uh, keep that connection, keep keep make decisions as to how best I can serve. You know, for example, I'm here in the community. I, I retired as a teacher. Oh, for the third time, <laughs> uh, last year. 
<laughs> last year. The last here. time, or maybe not the last time. <laughs> no, I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah, my arm is um, my arm is going to get broken. The more mm-hmm. twisting that uh, is done there. No, I I also looked at well, okay, so how can I, uh, how can I be effective within my community and. Um, so I have got involved in in various uh, groups of, of or, or groups looking at change out of the change cycle within the foundation and within the community, the community change process. And I was involved with what was called the inquiry circle of stakeholders from different organisations within our community here that set up this inquiry circle to look at how we could work better together, and which morphed into a collaboration circle of, yeah, okay, how can the different organisations uh, uh, work more effectively uh, together? So looking at this bigger community thing, and, and, and I'm involved with DEVCOM, the Development Committee, uh, which looks, which meets more regularly and is involved with this this um a future framework of, of of development in our in our community here. So I'm involved in that, but also needing that because uh, I believe, like in the classroom, in on on Ered and 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 in, within this community, that we need to demonstrate in what we do with our hands. So taking on the lead in leading volunteers for the rebuilding of the sanctuary. So there's something physical happening rather than just ideas and and how can we build or rebuild our community through creating a building you know yeah it's rather like in the classroom how can we how can we uh how can we uh do the learning through making um through working together on something how can we do that i think that call to action is a very inspiring note um, to end on. And I think it really sums up a lot of the brilliant work that you've done in your life, in which I find very inspiring, because I'm still finding my niche. Mm. Yeah. And to, uh, to see you and all that you've done and all that you are, I find that very inspiring. So mm. thanks for talking to us today, Jonathan. And uh, before we go, is there anything else you'd like to say to the listeners? or to the people of Fintorn or the people of the world? Yeah, I mean, I thank you, Callum and Alex, for the opportunity just to capture a few words. Um, it, it's always useful to reflect on things. Uh, and, and, yeah, hopefully that you find avenues to get this out further because there's one thing, you know, working within... The, if you like the Finhorn bubble, or mm. the bubble of eco villages, or the bubble of uh, people that have been here, but it is a bubble. You know, the the, the world is big. Yeah, uh, lots of thoughts and so on. I think that the thoughts that come from here they can be I- inspirational. They can, and this place can create a venue for people to get together to to look at new thoughts, new ways of doing things. You know, it, I, I think that it, it is important that the message gets out and I look forward to seeing how you actually develop uh, those ways to communicate further. Okay, and mm. uh, yeah, I'll keep tabs on how you get on in finding, you know, what, uh, the, what talents you're going to be highlighting in bringing about change in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah.